<laughs> What's up, everybody? This is Pastor G out here at 30th and Martin Luther King. You know what we're doing. We are in the middle, at least we're on the backside of the 30 Day 10 campaign. I was told we had day 20. We got 10 More magnificent day. days left, about to hit the single digits. Uh, and kind of a bittersweet uh, because even though, um, even though, um, you know, being out here, sleeping on that hard thing right there or sleeping out in a wet tent or wherever I've been is not the most glamorous thing. It is somewhat bittersweet uh, that this is coming to an end. But one of the things, like I told you, one of the things that uh, we've been doing, if you've been keeping up, is we've been trying our best to provide solutions right. to the people in the community. Uh, the last time we were out here in 2015, yes, we were here. We were listening. We were loving. We were praying. But this time we wanted to bring about solutions so that people could walk away from the tent feeling empowered. Not uh, We don't ma- mind if they walk away prayed for it. We also want them to walk away empowered to actually to do something. Okay. And so part of that was we brought in experts uh, and individuals that we felt uh, were able to answer many of the questions that our constituency had. And today I want to talk with a good friend of mine. She's a good friend of my family, good friend of the cause. Attorney Pamela Grant Taylor is in the house. If we had applause, we'd be like, yay, ah, yay, woo. Pamela Grant Taylor's there. Now, you just, um, you can say hello. Good afternoon. All right. Now, you just finished up a session, uh, kind of a twofer. A twofer. You kind yes. of finished up a little bit on, uh, on what two topics? Um, we had a session about... Uh, family law, some of the issues I see coming to my law office. Mm-hmm. Um, the biggest thing is with grandparent rights. Okay. Um, and then we talked a little bit about child support and emancipation. Okay. And then followed up with uh, parents, non custodial parents. Uh-huh. And I won't just say mom or dad because right. non custodial could mean either one. Right. But non custodial parents that are not having the parenting time or visitation with their children. So that was the family law portion. And then we talked about expungements under Indiana law. Okay. Uh, now, this, is, this, this has been a conversation that we have been, you and I, Right. And a few others have been having for years. years. <laughs> and we do mean years. And let's talk a little bit about some of the things that we found were challenging early on. Because I want to understand what has become better, worse, not so worse, whatever. One of the things we continue to hear back about four, four or five years ago was that a lot of our potential particularly, I guess you call non-custodial fathers, right. were having this issue of uh, not being able to uh, get their visitation because they were not current on their child support or something along those lines. Right. Where are we with that challenge? Okay, it's still a challenge, but they are two separate issues. Okay. There is a legal... Which they've op- always been two right, issues, two but issues. somehow we've had them confused that they were right. somehow the same. Because what I see when I go to court is that um, a lot of non-custodial parents will be paying child support and then they may change jobs, they may lose a job. There's no income withholding order. So you're coming in to court because of the obligation to pay or your obligation to pay your support's not being met. Gotcha. So while the non-custodial parent is there, they're like, hey, judge, well, I have your ear. By the way, I'm not getting time with my children, right. and the judge is not addressing that. And a lot of times, the non-custodial parent gets frustrated. Right. But what has to happen is the non-custodial parent has to file a petition with the court uh-huh. to say, "Hey, mom is not, or dad is not letting me have my parenting time." Gotcha. And you can file the petition. You don't need an attorney to do it. They have the forms online. And okay. the self-service. Okay. The problem now is, is that one time they used to have a law library in the city county building. Right. It got moved out. Now it's at Central Library on St. Clair. Okay. But, 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 but the but, new so problem. Is that, does that separate the law library from where you actually get it done? Like, Well, you can do the forms online. Right. Print them out and then take them back and file them. But the new 
glitch in Marion County is that they're gone to electronic filing system. Okay. So that means you have to go to the clerk. The clerk has to scan it in and upload it into computer because they're transitioning away from paper files to electronic files. Okay. I, I, I hear gaps all over the place with this. Yes. And, and, and so on one hand, you're saying that's better. But on another hand, I see sort of these areas where we could lose people. Right. In the process. Because right. you mentioned names of you've got the file with the clerk's got to scan and you've got to go to the library to get right. the download and then fill it out and take it in. And right. And it then, may be simpler, but it sounds yeah. to me. And then more recently, they opened the Family Resource Center, which uh-huh. is in the center tower sixth floor. Uh-huh. And they have computers there where you can actually print out the forms. thing about it is. There's a fee associated with getting the forms printed. I mean, it's a nominal fee because I think so, it's like ten or fifteen cents a page. So if is you're pleading, on special the, paper or something? Or no, it's just you have to pay for the access. I think so. So, so is that possible that we could access those forms like where we are right now, print them off, and anybody could get them from where we are? Or they yes. got to come from down there. No, so. they're they're on the state Ooh. supreme court website. So you can print them off from anywhere. You know what I mean? Like, woo, got to get them from the city county building. No, you don't have to go there. (laughs) But you have to go there to file it. Right. That's the problem. You have to go there to file it. Okay. So in essence, they can get the forms from anywhere. That's correct. And then, but they got to get them. They got to fill them out, and then they got to go down to the city county building. What floor? The sixth floor in the center tower. Okay. It's called the Family Resource Center. It's in room T six four four. T six four four, and they can file the form. That's correct. Again, you got to understand this is a this is filing a petition. Yeah, a petition for contempt if you're not getting your parenting time. Y'all catching that? Petition for contempt if you are a mother or a father that is non custodial. That's correct. And you are not receiving your parent time. You no longer need the help of an attorney. You can file that petition yourself as long as you go online to what website? It's the um, Indiana Supreme Court website. Um, They have self-service forms. Okay. And you can go to that website. You can do a Google search, put in Indiana Supreme Court self-service forms. Okay. They'll give you options. Under the options, they'll have things about child support, about parenting time, you go under the parenting time, and they have contempt for parenting time, and it has all the instructions you need to fill out the form and how to file it. Now, now are these instructions written like Dr. Seuss books or or uh, Wall Street bit, Journal. They're not Wall are Street they Journal. Legalese? Are no they legalese. No legalese. It's, it's simple fairly, form. They tell you how many copies you need, where to take it. Okay, so y'all catch that uh, because again, this is, and I'm saying that because this is an issue that we had before. And I'm trying to see where we are on this issue. So in your estimation, uh, there are some things that they're doing that might make it easier right. on their side. Correct. But I'm wondering, is that helping on the consumer you know, side? Is it really helping? And if so, give me a sense of how. What's They have added more judges in the paternity court in particular. Uh-huh. So now they have five judges. Okay. So... They have more judges available to hear these types of cases. Mm-hmm. However, there are so many cases. If you file a petition now, uh-huh. unfortunately, you may not get a court date until October wow. or November. Okay. So you're looking at several months out. And then in the meantime, you also have the, if you file things on your own, you also have to make sure that the other parent has notice. So you have to have proof that you provided the other parent with what you filed. So how do you do that before you So you need you to file? send it. Well, you have to file it, and then you get the file stamp copy back, and uh-huh. then you send it to the other parent. You can either send it by sheriff service, certified mail. Does that cost? Yes, it does. Here we go again. All righty. Everything costs. Can you, like, can you, like, hand it to them and take a picture of yourself handing it to them? Um, that is not sufficient because you are not an officer of the court. So, okay. If you know somebody that would serve it for you, okay, that might work. But the easiest, quickest way is to send a certified mail. Certified mail is like maybe six or seven dollars. Okay, and you'll get the little green card back. Send it back to yourself. But this is better than it used to be. Yes, there are improvements. It's it's a hard. 
it's kind of like, you know, a mouse pushing a boulder. Yeah. But they're moving in the right direction. It's just the access, and people need to be educated about what to do and how to do it. Okay. All right, and that's what we're trying to do, is we're just trying to get people aimed in the right direction. Right. Now, what happens if in filing that paperwork you make a mistake? Will they review it before they receive it, or are they going to just take it the way it is if you made a mistake? They're going to take it the way it is because you have, unfortunately, have the obligation to know what's wrong, figure out what's wrong, and fix it. So does but any- the paternity court is good. If there's something wrong with it, they will send you notice back and say, this is what's wrong, fix it. Okay, but you know the obvious question to that is, when am I going to see, receive that notice, and are they going to extend my time, or are they going to keep me on my same court date? They'll you know keep you saying? on the same court date. And so give me time to fix that as we yes, head it towards that October. That's correct. In our, in our example. But you have to check and make sure, and they have the online access to the dockets now, uh-huh, uh-huh. especially for paternity petitions, since July 1st of 2015. So anything filed after that date, you should be able to look at it online. And there's a website. It's uh, mycase, M-Y-C-A-S-E dot I-N dot okay. gov. Okay. And you can look up Marion County cases and several other counties in the state of Indiana. Okay. So hopefully those who are watching this, if you have any issues with anything like what we're talking about, the family law stuff, then you, you're catching some of this. And, you know, I'm going deer in the headlights. But I, I, it's not a pressing issue for me. Right. But this is important information. Correct. So at the end of the day, uh, whether it's pressing for me or not, this is information that is critical for somebody to have their hands on, which is why I think it's important that we get this out uh, for people. Now, let's go. Let's. And I'm, okay. I'm going to get into this grandparent thing that you're right. just talking about. I understand that was like a, a sort of a major question. But right. I'm also kind of dovetail another little piece in there. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it may play directly to the question, and it may not, but you clarify for me. We had an incident outside this building a couple of days ago. Okay. And in the middle of the incident was a child, an 18-month-old. Okay. And so because it became a crime scene, so to speak, and there was some drugs and maybe a weapon some other stuff in the mix, the child had to kind of sit in the middle of this crime scene. Okay. And there was no one that could deal with it because CPS, like it's what it's called, CPS was called. Okay. And so the big question seemed to be, what's going to happen with this child? Now, from what I was told, chances are that CPS takes the child and the child's going to end up right back with his mother. More than likely, yes. Which, if you look at the situation, a rational person is going to say, this is probably not the best environment for this child. When you consider that just a week prior to or whatever, he was sitting on the lap of his mom and both mother and father were carted off in a paddy wagon downtown. And they're going to take the child and then send the child right back. Then you had this other lady come down the street who wanted the child. Not sure why she didn't get the child. So I'm kind of dovetailing some other things because we have a lot of that, uh, can I say foolishness, going on where you got children caught up in in stuff. And they end up back in what I would consider to be not necessarily the best environment. I'm trying to figure out how does that happen and how can other family members, per se, kind of enter into that mix and try to provide a more stable situation when there's that kind of thing going on. An 18-month-old sitting in the middle of a crime scene that's going to leave a parent and then go right back into that situation. Okay. That situation, there's a lot of layers to it. But at the base of it, it depends on the relationship between mom and dad. Because if mom and dad aren't married, mom has custody under Indiana law. Okay? So if a grandparent comes into that situation, if it's mother's mother, she may have a better chance of getting the child than father's mother. Especially if legal paternity has not been established for dad. Because if dad doesn't have legal paternity, he has no legal rights to the child. Now, legal paternity, that's, that's before you left the hospital, you said that's my child. No, that is an acknowledgement of paternity by signing a paternity affidavit. Okay. Because in Indiana, if mom and dad aren't married, dad's rights come through a court order. So there has to be a judgment of paternity issued by a court. That judgment of paternity will say mom is mom, 
dad is Joe Blow. According Joe, to? According to Indiana law. And Joe has whatever rights to the child or so, so certain kind of custody. Do we have challenges in that area in Indiana? We do because, um, like I said, if mom and dad aren't married, everything goes to mom. Everything defaults to mom. Mom and don't like that, though, does mom? A lot of moms don't. But a lot of fathers are becoming aware that they have rights and what they need to, need to do to assert their rights. Okay, on a scale of 1 to 100, how, how aware is dad of those rights uh, in, in these kind of sh- shaky situations where there's no uh, legal paternity. A, a baby coming and a mother over here, dad over there? Scale of 1 to 100, how likely is it that dad, based on your experience, that dad is going to know his rights in that situation? That would be a zero. What? No, she did. Oh, it stopped. Oh, oh y'all. Zero. No, 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 no. Y'all missed it. I'm sorry. Y'all missed it. Wait a minute. No, 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 no. I can't believe that. The scale of one to one hundred, not one to ten, but one to one hundred. You're saying that the chance that dad knows his rights when he, when mom and dad are not married, child is on his way, the chance that he really knows his rights in that situation, you're saying is zero. In my experience, it's been zero, maybe one, maybe two. So we got some education to do. Yes. Y'all hear that? I'm, are y'all hearing this? Wow. And then, okay, so then let's go. So now baby's here. Okay. And now we got some issues because now it's prevalent. We got, right. we got diapers and pampers and milk and all that. And now dad is being asked to step up. Is Correct. dad saying, wait a minute. Don't I need to handle some business before I step up and assume this responsibility to do all these things? And chances are you can have five other people doing this, five other guys doing this. That's correct. You see what I'm saying? That's correct. Where are we once we actually get into the mode of parenting? It's a process because depending on the hospital, a lot of fathers will ask for a paternity test and they won't get it. Why? Why? Um, Isn't it, doesn't he have a right to know? He does have a right to know, but some, it just depends on the hospital. Some hospitals go with the adage that, you know, it's mother's baby, daddy's maybe. So if the mother says, but, I don't want my baby tested, a lot of hospitals won't test. So in Indiana, give me an idea of one hospital that doesn't. Um, I know I have a case right now, and it was at Eskenazi father asked for a DNA test at the hospital and mother told the staff not to give him one so the child was discharged with mom without dad getting his test so even though the test can clarify things correct what moral and to some degree ethical grounds are they standing on to deny a test that could clarify a lot of things I don't know that. I'm only going off what my client represented to me as the father or alleged father. Uh huh. So we have a case coming up next week where the court's going to decide whether or not he gets his DNA test or not. And I think the child is six or seven months old now. Okay. So you tell me, is that ridiculous or is it me? It's ridiculous, okay, but unfortunately, check. Check. that's what we're dealing with. I want to check. And, 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 and here's the deal. We could, go, we, could, we could go back and blame mom or blame dad. We don't have time for that because baby's not going to wait right. for us to finish pointing fingers at who did and who didn't. The reality is, is that that child needs to know whose blood is running through their veins. Correct. And who they should look to or look for. And even if dad or mom is not going to be in the mix, at least I know. Correct. That this person is or is not going to be in the mix, and that's my biological whatever. I think that's ridiculous, but that's just me. I agree. Yeah. Okay. So, in essence, what you're saying, though, is that with regard to the grandparents stepping into the mix, we're defaulting to, to mother. Correct. In, in general. Correct. Well, maybe, maybe more specifically, we're defaulting to mother in a, in a very general sense. But when it gets complicated, where are grandparents, when it gets complicated, like mom is, is acting a nut, dad is disappeared, child is in flux, where are we when it's a little more complicated? 
they're supposed to look for, because ideally DCS wants to place the child with relatives. Um, the thing with DCS is the relatives have to step up and be available, and they do background checks. Uh-huh. And the grandparent can't have any history with DCS themselves, which can be a problem because wow. abuse can be generational. Yeah. Um, an allegation can linger on for years. Yeah. So if maybe grandma had a history with DCS and, you know, matured and got her life together and now yeah. her children are having Trying problems, but. she may not be a proper placement. It'll just take extra steps and extra things, extra but, things on, but. extra but. things on the grandparents part. So <laughs> it can be overcome. It's just a lot. Okay. So. I not, can I turn, I'm sure you didn't talk about this piece, but I need to turn a corner on something because you brought something up. And that is, um, we have a lot of situations, uh, apparently, where um, you have a child, a mother and a father who are not married, uh-huh. uh, and then you get these grandparents yes. who may or may not like the way the situation is. Correct. Uh, and almost can kind of team up on the other parent. So you got a mother and a grandmother mm-hmm. and maybe grandfather that are all in cahoots and not liking the, the, the father of the baby. Or you got the mother, the grandmother, and the father not liking the mother of the baby. Correct. And causing chaos challenges mm-hmm. that become legal ones okay when say for instance the uh, police are called on an allegation of something that may or may not be true and because that is the presumption if you will of some sort of something happened and we right. got a phone call all right well maybe that is true maybe it's not true but because the call was made somebody got to go to jail or somebody got to be taken down because somebody said something happened and and even if the mother of the baby said, no, it didn't, but the mother of the daughter said, yes, it did. Mm-hmm. You understand what I'm getting at? Yes. I know this sounds complicated, but I'm actually thinking through an actual situation. And so now you've got a situation where where somebody's paying the price for something that was not true. Right. And the mother, literally, the, 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 the mother of the baby mm-hmm. literally cannot change the situation because her parent started this whole thing. Right. And so since he started it, I guess Indiana law says they're going to gonna finish it. Right. They have to do an investigation at the very minimum because DCS operates on, they err on the side of caution. So they have an obligation under Indiana law to investigate everything and see where it takes them. So they have different levels of investigations if the investigation becomes substantiated, then it may lead to another step where they may or may not file charges in the Child and Needed Services Court at juvenile court. So it just all depends on the nature of the allegation that was made, who made it. Um, they'll do an investigation. They'll talk to all parties involved. And a lot of times those cases end up being unsubstantiated, no action is taken, or they may do a further investigation. Okay, so how good are we doing in the state of Indiana with regard to uh, these type, types of incidents where an investigation ensues and it is found that the statements were inflammatory uh, and not necessarily true, and then now we got to backtrack and try to clear the name of the individual to whom the allegations were laid on in the first place? Um, it's getting now a lot better. Now that person better. has lost his job or her job. That person has lost, you know, other things. That person, you know, all these other things have, have gone on. Where are we in Indiana with, with that? Um, if that happens, there is an administrative process through DCS to clear up the allegation. But as far as the other person getting their employment restored and all that, there's not a whole lot of remedies to address that. So, I mean, is there nothing one could do uh, or, you know, I'm thinking about, to me, if somebody lied on me, you know, the libel, the slander, I'm trying to figure out what can I do to say, hey, that ain't cool. You can't, you know, you've just, you, you basically could have destroyed 
this person's life and remember that this is the other parent of your grandchild. Right. And is there th- no there's not recourse? a whole lot there's not a whole lot that can be done. Um, I just know more recently there was a family in northern Indiana and there were allegations that they may have killed their child and they actually did not. It was some medical problem that was undiagnosed. They ended up suing DCS and they end up winning a $25 million judgment. But when it comes to people making allegations against other parents, a lot of those allegations get screened out through DCS and may not escalate to a certain level, but there's always exceptions to any situation. And it's unfortunate that, you know, that may have happened to someone that you know um, where they're fighting and trying to get their things restored, but the court can only do so much. There's only so many court remedies where it gets down to a point where people just don't get along and there are just some people, there's nothing you can do that will, you know, soothe them and they just get on a vendetta and it's not illegal, but it's not right either. Right. So, and I think in the case you're talking about, it's something where it's clearly not right, but it's not illegal because the system played its part out. They found that everything was unsubstantiated. It just resulted in the very extreme circumstance where this person lost their employment and all the other things and there's fractured relationships and at the base of all that is a child that doesn't have good relationships with parents or grandparents. Right. So, uh, so, you know, I'm not a attorney. I don't do what you do. I'm not in a legal profession. I'm sort of a community advocate. I'm a pastor. Okay. And so we have to deal with situations a little differently than you do. Correct. You've got a certain set of things you got to do in a certain way you got to do them. And to some degree, there are some of the things that you said fall into our purview as pastors Correct. and community leaders and advocates in saying that people need to consider the big picture Correct. when making allegations against other people. It's almost like be careful pointing one finger at somebody else because there's actually a thumb coming a, back yeah, at you. something pointing back at you. Right. And I think if there's anything that anybody can take away, at least from the little bit that we're talking about right now, is we got to be careful to really consider the innocent exactly. in the context of what, uh, the, you know, the drama that we're creating for other people. Correct. You know, because some people are addicted to drama. If they ain't none, they create it. Exactly. Right? And so I would, that's also a relational conversation. Some folks you just need to stay away from. Exactly. And certainly don't lay down with them and make no babies with them. Okay? Because that's that only, true. that only sets yourself up. For how many years you got? 19 years. I thought it was 18. It's 19 for Jesus the child Christ. support. Jesus Christ, 19 years. And in the college, what about that? That's an additional filing, and it could go on to maybe age 22 or 23. Wow. Okay, so what else? Okay, let's get, let's jump. I guess we can jump over to uh, expungement. Yes. Expungement was a big hot topic. Yes. A couple years ago. Yes. Uh, had a lot of questions about it. We were doing a lot of work on expungement. Uh, is it still a hot topic today as it was two years ago? Yes. How much so? Um, A lot of people are still seeking to get that remedy, but the thing about it is um, the forms are available, but they do require a little more expertise that attorneys are best suited to handle because with the expungement in the statute itself, if you do something incorrectly, you may not be able to petition again for three years. Wow. But you can petition again, but not for three years. That's correct. Okay. Because I thought that you you done. No, it. that was under the earlier versions. Okay. Once you petition, you mess it up. It was like a wrap. But they yeah. put the more recent versions. Like okay. if you, you made a mistake, there was like a three-year period where you have to do it again. Okay. Sometimes if you petition without the use of an attorney and it gets denied, and then you go seek the advice of attorney. Some judges may consider your, if you reapply again gotcha. with an attorney, they gotcha. may consider that. Okay. But um, it just depends on the type of error that was made. Because the, the biggest thing I find with people that consult with me is that they're too premature. They're too early in the statute. They're petitioning too early. And that's why they get denied. 
You mean before the seven years or whatever it is? Well, now, it, it just depends on what it is. So if you have, if you're trying to expunge an arrest or a dismissal, there's no time frame for that. Oh, really? But you can only do one in your lifetime. Okay. Okay. If you have a misdemeanor conviction, it's five years after conviction. Okay. If you have a class D felony or level C felony, it's eight years. Okay. And then if it's higher than a level, it's like a level five or higher up to level one in certain circumstances or a class C felony or class B or A, it's 10 years. But the caveat is if it's a class A felony, class B felony or level one or two felony, you have to have permission from the Marion County Prosecutor's Office or the prosecutor's office in the county where you're petitioning. Okay. Okay. So there's a lot of different hoops you have to jump through. They have a checklist. Mm -hmm. You go through the checklist, see if you meet it, you might be in good shape. So but are you, you have to have that people are, are not going through the checklist. Or that's they correct. They're like realistic, like oh, I'm close, or I just yeah, don't I'm close, or somebody. The biggest thing is somebody told me right. I could do it, so right. I did it. You wow. might be six months out, and then you have to wait three years now because you were too premature. Is there a conflict between those who are trying to get things expunged and they, and they were released from jail or prison or whatever on one date, but they're not, they haven't, they're, they're whatever, they, their sentence is another date. You know what I'm talking about? Where if I was, in, if, I don't know, if I, was in, if I was sentenced to four years in jail or something, or, or prison, right. and I did two years, uh -huh. but I came out, I may be on probation or something for right. another two right but somebody's like well i'm out so you know i'm gonna count no you have to go from your date of conviction so so it's not release date after that fourth year right if i was convicted to four years uh-huh and i was out in two but i had four i don't count I don't know how. I don't. You know don't count it. the release date. You count you the date. Yes, you count the date that you were convicted. So, say for example, you got convicted of a misdemeanor on okay. July first, twenty twelve. Okay. Okay. If you got convicted on that date, five years later, which would be July first, twenty seventeen, you can file your expungement. Right. So for that all that other stuff that happens in between there is irrelevant. Right. And I think that's the, I think that's the question that keeps coming up. Exactly. Where people are paying attention to what? Well, you know, I've, I've been doing this and I've been out here and I did that and I served this. So and it's I did not that, it's not your release date; it's your conviction date. All right. If you that, go by I conviction date. Yeah. I hope that helps. Somebody. And don't pick up new things. Like if you have a speeding ticket, that doesn't count. But if you have, like, a misdemeanor, then you pick up a felony, right. they're going to go by the later date for the felony. Gotcha. So the felony is going to be 8 to 10 years. Gotcha. And it's going to be 8 to 10 years from the most recent date. Gotcha. gotcha. So that happens to a lot of people because sometimes they may have a misdemeanor, they will pick up a felony. Mm -hmm. The felony will be after the misdemeanor. Mm -hmm. They may qualify under the misdemeanor part, but the felony, you're kind of hit. Gotcha. Or you may do a felony first, then do a misdemeanor. Then you have to add the time frame to the misdemeanor conviction. Gotcha. So it's it's a little complicated Chinese math, but we can sit down and work it out. But that's why you're saying in some instances it's better to have an attorney that's to correct. actually pull this paper together, paperwork together and to be clear exactly. about what, okay, where are we here? Because I usually, if people consult with me, I sit down and look at everything and then I tell them this is the earliest date you can petition and give them a specific date and year. Gotcha. Because there have been several. Yeah, there are several people have come in. You know, they may not be eligible till 2018 because I did an expungement seminar earlier this year in February. Mm -hmm. And there are like five or six individuals. They wouldn't qualify till 2018. Wow. And okay. I told them the day, you know, the month Don't and come day. Don't come talk to me until. Right. Blam. Right. Well, the earliest day you can petition. It's not don't come talk to me. You can talk to me and I'll let you know you may not be eligible to file till July 1st, 2018 okay. or January 1st, 2020. But that's when you're eligible. OK. All right. OK. So uh, I'm going to let you go because I know you got a lot going on. Thank you. And I just wanted to spend some time uh, with those who kind of follow us. And again, y'all share this information uh, this uh, with anyone who's dealing with some of the things we talked about. Uh, the paternity issue, the grandparent issue, the custo uh, custody issue, right. uh, the expungement issue, uh, and even some of the little crazy stuff that I mentioned. 
uh, which were some of the actual situations that some people come to us with, uh, because it's easier to come to Pastor G and blow smoke up my skirt, right? <laughs> it's real easy to do that. But y'all got to understand, even for me, I'm going to reach out to somebody, and, and I have, and Pamela will tell you, there are times where I get situations. I'm not an attorney. Now, I'm going I'm to consult you on the relational thing. I'll consult Correct. you on the spiritual thing. I'll consult you on uh, how you deal with people. But when it comes to the legal stuff, I'm going to always make a phone call and say, hey, what should we do? And she'll probably say, have them call me. And that's what we'll do. Because some of this stuff, you can lie to me, but you don't want to lie to somebody who's trying to go to bat with you, number one, because she can probably find out quite exactly. a bit. Just by, you know, and I, for the life of me, I'll never understand why certain people stand up and just lie about certain things when you're trying to get help. When you're trying to get help, I said this on this past Sunday, when, when and there's a famine in your life and you need food, we need facts, right? We need the truth. We don't need manipulation. We need people that's willing to just lay it out all, all out on the line so that we can actually help you, okay? So I appreciate you for also being that kind of person that will pick up the phone, answer the phone, and will, to the best of your ability, give me what you think we can provide to others Correct. without, you know all of that legalese and yeah i try not to speak up there bring it down and if i don't know i try to find out and get somebody who does know (laughs) all right and also y'all know too there's other attorneys that we do have that are in the mix as well pamela's one of them there's others so just know if you got questions like that you know we'll always try our best to get you in touch with somebody who can help you out with your legal issues. But Pamela, thank you so thank much you. for coming out. We know you after you leave here, we won't see you again for a while. <laughs> but Godspeed, we're praying for you, praying thank for the you. family. And that's it. We'll chat with you on the flip side. Peace. <laughs>